you know, when you go to school, they don't teach you how to design a hospital or an airport or anything like that. They teach you design. And I focused on that. Business of Architecture, episode 385. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I am speaking with award-winning architect and designer, Suman Sorg, fellow of the AIA and founder of Sorg Architects. And she has also recently formed the non-profit design firm, A Complete Unknown, uh, in her home in Washington, DC. Uh, and the Complete Unknown design firm has a mission to promote social justice, peace and unity through architecture and design. Suman has over 30 years building a successful architecture practice. Some of her notable projects include the John and Jill Kerr Conway residence for formerly homeless veterans and the Southern Regional Technology and Recreation Center in Fort Washington. In this episode, Suman explains and discusses her career, how she founded Sorg Architects and how she transitioned from that practice into creating a complete unknown and the intentions behind doing that. She sum- summarizes her philosophy and goes into a lot of depth into her experience and overview in the career and how to run a profitable and successful architecture firm. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Suman Sorg. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. So, man, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Very good, thank you. Excellent. Now, you created Sorg Architects in the sort of mid 80s. Yes, I did. 1986, to be 19... exact. Fantastic. So you've been in, you've been in practice or running your own running your own show for over. 35 years coming up nearly nearly 40 years um and you're recently oh the God, has it been that long <laughs> <laughs> it's like i was just started yesterday <laughs> you're kidding me yeah i guess so i guess so well, well I, did... I didn't really feel like the first five years of the first practice or architects i mean i really think we got going in three to five years after we started do you remember much about those early days, the first few years, what it was like? What had you start the practice? Well, you know, I always um, th- thought uh, I want to be my own boss. Mm. But, you know, when you start your practice, you think you're going to be the boss. But then you realize you, you traded one boss for many bosses, like all the clients became bosses. Yeah. So I, I wasn't really free of bosses. But, um, you know, and I thought I, I you know, I, I was looking around and thinking, you know, every time I saw a building go up, I thought, you know, I can do better than that. Mm. <laughs> and so I, I you know, and all, all of the buildings around me were being designed primarily by firms led by men or single practicing men. And I thought, wait a minute. You know, there's got to be more than one voice here and there's got to be more than, you know, one, um, you know, hand that shapes the city. So I just threw my, you know, my hat in, you know, it was a big surprise to my husband Mm. because he, he had gone on a conference to Canada and I decided to quit my job. And when, when he got home, I, I said, guess what, honey? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> gave him the news and he wasn't that happy because we had a mortgage and a baby and but you know I had I had I you know I thought if I don't make it in like two two and a half years I'll just shut the doors but mm. in the first in the very second year we broke even and in the third year we started making a little bit of money so I hung it I hung in there what what was some of the early lessons that you learned 
running yeah, business? Yeah, you know, the biggest thing was, okay, so when I first started, I thought I wanted partners. So I kept asking people around me, people were my colleagues that were working with me and, you know, some old friends, college friends, if they wanted to partner with me. And, you know, uh, they had, you know, they just bought a new car or a house. So they had, you know, they had other commitments and they weren't quite ready. And so, you know, I thought, well, okay, I'll just do it myself. Mm. And then in the end, I was truly happy that I didn't have any partners. I didn't have any partners at all um, because, uh, because, you know, I could just make decisions based on a lot of intuition and a lot mm. of just gut feelings. And I didn't have to explain it to anybody. And so <laughs> I was just uh, um, in the happy, actually, not to have to just uh, ask permission or forgiveness. Well, what's, what's the size of the practice nowadays? Well, now, you know, I'm, I have a new practice. It's called the Complete Unknown because yes. the first one was acquired. And um, it's right now we're about 10 people, mm. which is shocking. Because compared to where I was, you know, in the beginning, because we've only been launched since February. Yeah. But there's such a demand for what we're doing that we just, um, you know, had to ramp up quickly in the, just the last five months. So, um, you know, it's exciting and it's, it's uh, but, you know, I'm still very conscious of uh, quality and I don't want to just, you know, just grow for the, for the sake of growth. We're being mm. selective and what we're choosing to work on and selective about who we work with and who works with us. So, but it is, you know, much faster this time around. Um, what are some of the reasons for that faster, faster growth, if you like, with the, with the new practice? And also what was the inspiration or what had, what had you found a complete unknown? What is it? Oh, it's an unknown. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, answer your first question, why is it faster? Well, number one, you know, I, um, after about, what, th- 29 plus years in practice under SORG Architects, and I had a big um, client base, a lot of relationships, a big network yeah. in this part of the country, near Washington, in and around Washington and the inter- internationally. And so uh, that that reputation, which luckily happens has happens to be good, uh, uh, you know, ha- it really has uh, helped this time around. It's uh, you know, I, I didn't just have clients; I had friends. I mean, I I I had so many repeat clients over and over in my previous firm mm. that we just became more like family or friends. So it's it's. They're very much, again, this time around in support, but not just, you know, clients who've got projects, but communities and community leaders that I worked with, you know, all ha- ha- had real good goodwill with them. And so mm. it's, it's been easier this time around because, you know, first, when I first started out, first of all, there weren't very many, many women in practice and yeah. It's really a, a huge glass ceiling, and there's still a glass ceiling right now. But um, it was a it was a bigger hurdle uh, uh, at that time. I was truly a complete unknown. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the that's the, so that the speed I think is because of that, and also I think there's just a huge need for what we are doing, and um, but this time around, of course, you know the inspiration is actually all the past projects I did and what I really enjoyed doing and which ones were meaningful. And so, so I'm focusing on, on those things. And, you know, as you know, our firm is focused on, um, you know, serving the underserved yeah. uh, you know, people like uh, who are experiencing homelessness or, you know, low income housing mm. or, in communities with food deserts or entertainment deserts or, you know, um, in every building type in underserved communities that certainly deserve design, deserve design excellence. And it doesn't matter that they can't afford it because we have to have, you know, whatever we do as architects has lasts a long time. 
So, uh, you know, every building is at least a 50-year fifty year old li- yeah. lifespan. So it's important to, to really uh, pay attention to that. It's, it's interesting. This is a conflict that many architects face in their careers is that often the work that they do serves the 1%, if you like, of society. Um, and there's often a kind of desire, particularly we see it more with young, kind of younger generations of architects wanting to serve something social, something meaningful. With your experiences in um, in Sorg Architects, was that something that was on your mind, if you like? No. <laughs> I wanted to, you know, design the tallest sides, glassy sky, skyscraper. I wanted to be, you know, our role models in school were all wrong. You know, they were all the, you know, the, the form making. The, it was all about aesthetics. It was all about, you know, um, you know, we were, we were, you know, putting up on pedestals all these people mm. that were more focused on their own ego-driven <laughs> concept <laughs> of, of design. And so, um, and, but what happened is, you know, because we were a minority firm, a woman-owned firm, we often got the, you know, what were considered the crumbs of all the, you know, uh, projects that people had to offer and um, those ended up to be actually the most meaningful ones because, you know, they weren't high fee, but the gratitude and the, the you know, just the way we, we were able to help communities and actually change people's lives was, became much, much more meaningful. And mm. so that's why I'm really focused on it on, in this, this new uh, endeavor. You were you were mentioning earlier about that kind of glass ceiling or some of the obstacles that you faced um, being a, a you know a, a female led practice back in the late latter part of the eighties and early early nineties. How do you think that things have progressed nowadays, or do you think there's still still a long way to go? I think there's still a long way to go. You know, you um, you uh, have a lot more, of course women graduating from young women graduating from college but you know there's still some off tracking you know when women have children uh, they become the primary caregivers and also if you look at just the stats you know there's very few women in the upper you know um, leadership of the bigger firms Mm. and there is, you know, some effort nowadays I see, I mean, I never, we had no trouble finding the most excellent women and we had no trouble find, you know, uh, recognizing their abilities and promoting them them to, to, you know, the highest levels in the firm. But it's not only the architecture, architects themselves, it's also still an uphill battle with contractors, it's uphill uphill battle with owners and the big developers. I mean, um, you look around and, and, you know, all the big real estate developers here and in New York and uh, everywhere really in their roster of architects don't have a lot of female architects. Well, why do, why do you think that is? I think it's just the culture, you know, it's changing, you know, it's changing. Uh, and in every profession, in medicine, yeah. in law, and, you know, you name it, it's, it's, it's just been a sort of a mindset that is changing slowly. And, you know, it's going to change much faster now because, we just don't have enough people to do the things that we need to do, uh, the demands there are on us. So, mm. you know, that's driven some of that's driven some of what's going on. And um, you know, and then women, you know, were, were denied opportunities outright. You know, even in you know, like in my lifetime, um, schools were were didn't allow women. You know. Uh, and that changed and then so I think it is changing and changing a little bit faster but uh, it's still there Mm. do you do you when you were when you first set up 
Sorg Architects. Do you remember how you won your first projects? Yeah, I, I um, you know, um, went to get my hair done. <laughs> after, after I quit my job, I didn't have any, I mean, I didn't line up any clients or anything. I thought, well, wait, hey, <laughs> why, why wouldn't people hire me is how I thought because I was doing so well for other people. Yeah. And um, so I went to get my hair cut and I told my hairdresser, you know, I, I just started my firm. And he said, you know, I'm starting, a, I'm opening a new shop in, 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 uh, you know, uh, near G, uh, near Georgetown University. And uh, I want to, I want, can, do you think you can help me with that? And I did. It was my first job. And I went way overboard and I built <laughs> models. I did these, it was just a shop. And then I don't know what happened. There was a Washington Post reporter walking by after it was built. And it had this wonderful neon trellis a pink neon trellis and he, it caught his eye and then it got published in the Washington Post magazine as they got a little bit of, you know, attention because of that. But my own training was in big jobs because I used yeah. to work for Harry Weiss and all these other guys, you know, big projects all over the world. And so I, my scale, my idea of scale was much bigger. You know, I didn't, I hadn't done any houses or kitchens, or, you know, ever. So um, just so happened, you know, the, my employment before I started the firm was in these large firms. And so, you know, I, I knew I, I knew somebody who was starting her own firm, a developer, and she was uh, focused on low income housing and, um, you know, when I met her, I said, well, you know, I'd be very interested. And so she gave me a, a small chance. And then from that was became our first biggest client. And she's still our client. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, I think it was because she realized, you know, not just uh, what I was doing, but how I was doing it and how much she was integrated mm -hmm. in in the decision making of every aspect of the designs that we did for her. That's very impressive to, to hear that she's she's still a client. What 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 are some of the I had dinner with her last night. And we <laughs> we're gonna start a new job for her in Bradenton, Florida. Amazing. What why do you think or how do you what 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 advice would you give to practice owners to be able to cultivate a relationship for that length of period with a client? I think you have to be, you know, uh, human, <laughs> first of all, you know, you have to, you have to be loving. How yes. about that? Okay. So if you decide you love, you know, you love the people that you work with or the people you're serving or, mm. you know, for example, you can take something like say the accessibility code requirements. You need to think about them just as, you know, oh, we got to have ramps, we got to have, but if you had a, a son or daughter who was, you know, uh, had a disability, well, you would be so loving in the way you would fix your house so mm. they could move around and use it. And so my mindset is always just loving the, the person who will use it. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't find it an annoyance or I just, find it, you know, something I can do for somebody, mm. even though I've never met them. That's a very beautiful approach, being being loving and just kind of and recognizing that both both to to clients and to the end user. Where does that philosophy come from? Is that part I of think it's, <laughs> I think it's like um, um, you know just from the very beginning as a child I was, you know, I loved in insects i loved animals i loved uh i mean maybe from my family you know they were they were refugees i was born in a refugee camp camp i shouldn't say camp but housing in new mm. delhi after my parents were uh displaced from pakistan overnight and mm. so i think uh we were such a you know we were 
close knit and you know my dad actually was a loving man you know and he was a big role model uh, every time I, you know i hear women talk about their fathers and i always realize women that had that in their lives yeah really benefited and 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 when did you come to the us i came in 1968 <laughs> I was, and uh you know they, my father was in the us in the indian embassy and we came with him and so he you know he uh, uh, had a diplomatic posting in washington and that's why we ended up here and um so that, that that's been a, you know and then i hadn't gone back to india in a long time and then all of a sudden you know out of the blue just 10 years ago uh, except for you know visiting my cousins and aunts uh, once in you know every five years or so, um, um, uh, I got a call out of the blue from somebody who wanted to do wanted to uh, hire a Indian architect working <laughs> expat situation in Gurgaon. So I've been going back a lot more lately, and we did some you know um, uh, high rise housing projects in, in Gurgaon for him. Did you, when you first arrived in the US, were you, were you based in, in DC or? Yes, so because you... my father was here. Yeah, I, I really uh, didn't want to come. <laughs> I had so many girlfriends and I had, you know, I had a clique. <laughs> <of my own. laughs> and I, I was so unhappy, but, you know, in Indian families, you don't leave girls behind, you know, you don't. Uh, you, and then my father thought it would be a great opportunity. So, yeah, we ended up in Washington. Actually, I live no more than three blocks from where I mm. <laughs> where wow. I lived in Washington. I mean, speaking of deep roots, amazing. So you know, you know DC. I know. It. You know DC. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've lived through what uh, one, two, three, four, five, five or six, uh, five or six mayoral you know, regimes in DC. You, you would have, you would have also um, gone through a number of economic ups and downs. So you would have, your, your business would have survived a number of recessions over the years. What have been some of your strategies for surviving or weathering those kinds of economic storms? Well, one thing we were a very generalist practice, right? You know, it design, you know, when you go to school, they don't teach you how to design a hospital or an airport or anything like that. They teach you design. And I focused on that. And so I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to become, but sometimes you become a specialist, you know, serendipitously because, you know, you happen to get some, some huge job and you're just that, then you get the next one, the similar one. But somehow I don't, my practice was very diverse. I did schools and libraries, rec center, aquatic center, office, housing, you, you know, I didn't do, I did hospitals, some clinic hospitals, I even worked at Dulles Airport, you know, so I was just interested in all kinds of building types. And, you know, one guy hired me because he had a master plan for, wanted to do a master plan. I don't know if you know, in India, there's a lot of people trying to build private universities. Right. He had like 35 acres and he called me and he said, uh, first he said, you know what? I need you to design the shopping center for me behind the housing we had done. And then he then turns out his partner had point, promised it to somebody else. I was like, oh, no. And then he said, uh, okay, well, you know, this university is coming up and you can do that master plan for that. <laughs> I'm like, uh, no problem. I've been to a university. <laughs> I was paying attention and I've been to many of them. And so we ended up, you know, so it's like, it's really, uh, we, the client and I both learned a lot along the way. He's still my client. And um, so I was never afraid of experimenting. And, you know, it, it actually what's really interesting is that in the very last year of uh, Sorg Arch, you know, when I was still running Sorg Architects, Marriott called us and they said, we want you to rethink our mid 
a mid-level business travel hotel. And then I was like, well, I said, look, I have never done a hotel. Should I get a consultant? He says, no, that's the point. Because, you know, that's the point. Because, uh, uh, you know, you'll be looking at it all with completely fresh eyes. You don't have anything sitting on the shelf that you're going to hand me. Mm-hmm. And this is the chief of facilities at Marriott, which you know is in headquartered in Washington. And so, so I think that's, you know, just the kind of journey with the client and the excitement of learning together, I think, uh, helped us. And then also, I was careful in terms of, you know, guarding against inflation. So Washington is a strange case because, you know, so the private sector, you know, makes money and then the government collects the taxes and then it spends money and the private sector goes down and the government sector goes up. So Washington has always been quite protected from, uh, you know, very severe recessions. So we took advantage of that. And also I was, you know, I was very interested in any type of client. Mm-hmm. So we had government, we had private, we had nonprofit, we had, you know, shop owners, we had, you know, so, so I would, you know, some firms, for example, in 2001 got stuck because they kept, you know, they, they were just holding the bag because a lot of the tech firms collapsed and they were doing all these projects, you know, just focus on tech interiors. And luckily that never happened to me. Mm. And after the federal, and also Washington is a great, great place for just for that reason, because we have not only state, local, county and city governments, we also have the federal government. So there was always something going on in in, and I never shied away from government work. In fact, I loved it because they always paid their bills on time. <laughs> <laughs> as a as a business, having such a sort of diverse portfolio of of projects and work and work, did that ever cause problems inside of the business in terms of like where do we go next for you know which project should we approach next or? Yeah. Or in terms so, yeah. of delivery. Competitively, it was a slight, a, a quite a big, sometimes a disadvantage. As you know, we still had a very profitable, very comfortable, very good firm mm. and uh, well known. Um, uh, it, it, it's, you know, you if you went after a school, say, and then you compete, you were often competing with firms that just did school. So you had maybe four or five schools, they had 105 schools that they could show. But but each one of our schools was different and we had a completely different approach to how we, you know, created edu- environments for, you know, learning. And so I think, and, and we were able to explain how we got where we did, I think that helped. And none of our projects were repetitive in their design or or there was nothing you know, that we just sort of stole from one project to the other. So I think um, in that sense, it sometimes was a disadvantage, but also an advantage. How did you, how, how did you find your role changed from when you st- first started the practice to more recently, in more recent years? What was the kind of evolution of your actual role within the office? My, oh, yeah. You know, since I was uh, there, I didn't have any other principal that was financially responsible for yeah. the firm. So, um, you know, um, that didn't change. But I did, you know, uh, in the beginning, we were all just friends. And, you know, I would just, I never had an office. I was, I had a drafting board. I still have a drafting board I draw by hand. And, um, you know, um, but then, you know, it got out of hand. And so we we, st- we had to, we hired this company called, um, I think it was called the Cox Group. I don't know, it's a business, uh, I don't know if they still exist or not. Uh, and they, they advised us to <laughs> have a little structure. So we had, you know, a studio director, we had, um, you know, project managers and, 
and you know just a little bit you know and then it became clear some people were better at this or the other thing you know and so there was a couple of guys very good at construction supervision so they enjoyed it and so we said okay why don't you guys just handle that and so it was very um you know fluid though you know i mean we never really felt like i mean design happens at every stage of a project so i don't and people stayed and stayed in my firm because you know they saw uh, they they were every step of the way with me win or lose you know yeah. and also they saw it all happen you know how we made all that sausage right there in front of everybody so i think uh, um so so finally you know um i decided that uh, i needed to offload some of the administrative stuff so mm-hmm. we we created a marketing department and hired you know marketer uh, people who could write proposals um and then we created the administrative hr thing not huge and uh, some of them served also in the accounting department so all that became much more um, you know self contained and i didn't have to worry about xerox paper running out <laughs> <laughs> and so that part became easier for me as we developed these you know different departments did you uh, ever did you ever develop a, a department solely for business development or have somebody whose role was you know going out and finding the work or was that always your responsibility uh we had yeah i had a uh, a uh, business development uh, people who who did and marketing so there was a group of people who paid attention to advertised work because we did a, a lot of uh, public sector work so it it's all advertised you know right and you have to compete for it so you have to keep track of all the proposals and when they are due and what's due and so th- that was a very important role the, and then one of the people in marketing was also focused on you know just brand and visibility and social media and then there was uh, you know pe- there there was one main person and another assistant who you know attended all the events in the city and you know um did soft marketing and and uh take you know figure out who i should have lunch with you know <laughs> and and uh you know uh, even then we were very interested in aligning the work with the mission you know just the ideas that that now completely found that you know part of a basis of my new firm mm. but we were careful to look for you know um say for example we joined the, and you know i became a trustee at the national building museum and then you know i was a member of the just dc building association and those kinds of things so yeah there were and uh, i accompanied the business development person to that but there wasn't anybody who who you know was like um, charged with okay find five five jobs in six months no it was just like how can we you know have more outreach you mentioned there that it was you know the mission was very important in the business and that's often that's also been the kind of the foundations of a complete unknown um would you be able to articulate that mission like how how did you express it or what yeah, was it yeah so you know on the designs so there were many different back when we weren't a com- you know complete unknown as a non-profit yeah. new firm and so back when we weren't uh, you know we were very interested in the client's investment in design you know uh, you know uh, there are a lot of clients you know for, for example you know uh, in grocery stores you know it's very compa- repetitive and and controlled by you know the, whatever the corporate you know decisions are on detailing but so we weren't that interested in that we were interested in finding clients that had a problem but didn't you know and wanted a partner to solve it and so i think that was a, a selection that we did you know in terms of being being selective about about what um you know what kinds of projects we pursue 
And then my own, you know, background was very international, of course. And, and with my father being in being in diplomacy, you know, is very interested in international work. So we actually pursued the State Department to work in the diplomatic space. So that was a very, very powerful part of the firm and mm. lasted for years, 25 years. What kind of work were you doing there? Oh, well, wow. We did uh, 11 or 12 new embassy compounds uh, for the United States. We worked on, in 50 countries, did hundreds of projects, major renovations, additions, or, you know, new small buildings um, for the State Department all over the world. How, uh, w- when you were d- kind of building, particularly buildings of that caliber in other countries, um, and also being kind of localized or based in, in DC, did you ever set up satellite offices for? Those delivery of those sorts of projects, or did you ever consider opening up other offices internationally? We, did, we opened an office in India, uh, you know, because we were concerned about the quality of the work, you know, the craftsmanship actually. So when we were doing the work for um, for Irio, our client there, yeah. um, we did set up in their office an office of our own, where we hired local architects, uh, you know, uh, from, in, from, you know, New Delhi and other places. But um, as far as the projects we did for the State Department, the way they work is, first of all, the client, the older, the client, that's 400 people who actually work for the State Department in their buildings, the, you know, overseas buildings operations. Um, they are in Arlington. Uh, you know, Roslyn. So the client was here. Um, there's a um, a Buy America Act that you have to follow. So a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, con- contractors who who built the buildings were United States contractors. Right. And they were all over the country, down south and and other places. And so so the work itself. We used to we used to go to the site quite often and research materials, reach, research local availability and the climate and context and all that stuff. The the people who occupied the buildings were Americans and you know who cir- circulated in and out of those based on their tours. And so uh, the State Department has a very big construction department. So they manage the construction, but we help them with shop drawings and submissions and you know substitutions or whatever they needed to do during construction. So our construction department in Washington mm. handled that. Amazing. Um, in terms of a complete unknown, could you give us a little bit about how you made the transition from Sorg Architects into a complete unknown? Like what was what was that process like, and and how did it begin? It was like trial and error. So you <laughs> know, uh, I I uh, so uh, the firm was acquired in 2015, and I had a two year commitment with the firm that acquired us. And after that commitment was uh, um, finished, um, uh, I w- got recruited by Gensler in LA. And so I went out there for about, <laughs> I lasted only a year. <laughs> you know, I just couldn't, I just couldn't, uh, uh, I just couldn't uh, manage, you know, being, you know, uh, in such a big firm, there were 700 people there. I said, I, I, they were very nice people and treated me very well. I got to do some interesting projects for them in LA. And then I wasn't really an East Coast person, you know. And so I was like, you know, I was feeling homesick. So I decided, you know, no, that's, and my children live in the UK and they, so, you know, they would be going to bed when I was waking up and it was just impossible to even keep contact with them. Yeah. So I wanted to move back East. So then when I moved back East, uh, I thought I'd live in New York because that was my fantasy city. I'd always wanted to live there. And so I moved there. I thought, 
we want to start this non-profit and there's so many NGOs headquartered in, and part of our firm works overseas, you know, in the refugee space and uh, the new, new firm that is. And so, um, you know, um, but I was there in, in uh, March of 2020, mm. you know, I rented an apartment <laughs> at a big ease that I'd signed and, and COVID hit. And I just, I just knew, I just knew it was going, it wasn't going to be safe. So I went, I took the elevator down, and I walked over to Amsterdam Avenue, and there was a Hertz rental car. And I said, like, "Can you give me a car? I want to get out of this." <laughs> <laughs> they gave me a big, huge SUV. So I loaded it with my, you know, clothes, and I drove down to Maryland, you know, where I have a house here in on the on the shore. And I thought, oh, you know, I'll be here for three weeks and it'll be all over and I'll go back up there again. And, you know, I was already actually about to sign a lease for office space in Manhattan. Mm. And then, of course, it was not three weeks and it wasn't three months. It was 13 months, 14 months. And so I, um, and so I, 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 you know, I actually the landlord let me off um, you know, um, with some concessions. And so I, I, I decided that I, I loved being out here in the country with all the animals and all the, you know, wonderful beauty of natural beauty of this place. Mm. It really helped me and changed my mind about, you know, where I want to spend a lot of time in which environment myself. And so I'm committed to being here and in Washington. Amazing. You, you, you spoke a little bit there about how Sorg Architects was acquired by another, another company. How did that come about? Because that's quite, a lot of architects would love to do that or would love to package their business up or, you know, and often it doesn't happen or it's a very difficult thing to do. How did that, yeah, how did uh, that come about? Was that always a, always a, a vision that you had in mind or? No, 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 not really. We, we kept getting over the years, you know, we had a very stable practice, a practice that showed substantial profit over decades, you know. Yeah. I mean, not substantial, but consistent profit over, uh, and it wasn't, it was, it was pretty nice, <laughs> let's put it that way. And so the track record of the firm was very good. And um, we had a great deal of goodwill, a big variety of clients, a very broad foundation in this region, you know, in the Atlantic, uh, Atlantic seaboard area. And mm. so um, we, you know, we kept getting calls from different kinds of firms, you know, from different Midwest, from the North. And we always just said, well, what will we do? <laughs> you know, what will I do? And so in the end, what happened is uh, we ran in one, a, a firm had called us and then in, through a consultant, you know, and to talk to us, we said, no, thank you. And that consultant, you know, was um, quite convincing and, uh, you know, uh, 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 sort of uh, showed us how you could work you know, within a larger, larger context mm. and, um, you know, be not acquired as much as be partnered with, with, uh, uh, with another firm that had similar, you know, um, you know, ideas or, you know, had, had a lot of similarities. And so, you know, well, that's not a bad idea you know, that'll give a bigger pond for everybody to swim in, you know, yeah. and, and maybe, you know, and I would be, you know, uh, working on different diverse projects, you know, and, you know, I would, I would, um, I would have, I wouldn't have to sort of deal with all the, although I wasn't running the administration of the firm, I was responsible. And so that was the thinking, really. And making that sort of that purchase, if you like, or the how how the how Sorg Architects then became acquired, was your role then phased out, or 
was there a lot of was there a lot of disruption or change to the actual working of the practice or yeah i think my role as lead designer which is what my primary role at sorg was yeah uh, not really because um, we were the office that uh, this firm that acquired us was from the, from other parts of the country primarily west and midwest and so you know they needed a washington eastern seaboard presence so we were sort of a satellite you know group and uh, so um you know in the sense of a design lead no you know and i was a you know um a sort of a award winning designer and so that yeah. yes quite important to them um but i think um you know i think it 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 changed my role in the sense it it changed my role in the sense that um the stewardship of the firm was really uh, clearly um you know uh, no longer part of what uh, and so our destiny my own destiny mm. uh, i thought i was feeling like i didn't have control over that <laughs> i'm comfortable and and so that was the difference really that's the real difference amazing amazing um well what it, it's interesting actually to con- to consider you know other practice owners who were thinking about being acquired or would like that to happen do you have any advice for them or words of warning about the process <laughs> um yeah i think it's um it's a very difficult culturally you know to mix two firms and yeah um, it's very difficult um uh, you know since i didn't have partners and you know some actually friends of mine who are um principals of other firms that were around in washington called me and asked me what do you think you know should we do it what do you think they all seem to have partners you know some some form of their leadership you know will continue on and you know uh, it was just me so um i think um it's it's difficult when you know you've been your own boss for so long you know and you you know you've relied on things like intuition or you know um your your brain outside your brain which is you know your cell memory you know your instant evaluation of a person which you know luckily we were lucky enough to guess correctly mm. many times and so you know that part um can't be regulated it can't be uh, value it can it cannot be um explained actually and so my practice was very much like i never had a written business plan i never had uh, you know um I, you know like uh, any checklists or anything like that i mean there's so much in our lives that's metaphysical that i depended on uh, <laughs> maybe it's my eastern upbringing or something um so you know uh, that part can't be packaged and put in some slot somewhere so i think that would be harder if you are if you've been practicing by yourself mm. in an independent way so the, the the kind of formation of a complete unknown if you like um what were some of the what were some of the first projects that you became involved in with your new venture well we are working you know we're just five months old so uh, we're working on uh, uh we're working on projects that have you know more meaning than just you know making building buildings you know like yeah. for example we're working on a a a um a housing for wounded warriors from the Iraq war and you know i don't know if you remember in in my portfolio i had a project i did pretty large one in washington for formerly homeless veterans of the mm. vietnam era now these veterans you know um a lot fewer people died in iraq but a lot more got wounded in iraq and so um you know they 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 
flak jackets and other things saved them, but uh, they suffered from PTSD. And, uh, and so we're working with a client who's an NGO also, uh, who supplies um, emotionally supportive dogs to PTSD, people who came back wounded with PTSD. So we're designing a, a, a housing for their six week uh, stay when they get trained with the dog. And, and so it's a room with a dog, for a dog and a human being <laughs> as a hotel. And then what happens, you know, so it's very interesting. And um, so that's one of the projects. That's the kind of project, you know, I mean, it's not just about, you know, like making rich people richer or, or, or kind of just like, uh, I'm very interested in not just being human centric, you know, mm. and so that so that was important. There's a project we're working in Pondicherry, which is with the University of Pondicherry, where believe it or not, there's a lot of um, suicide amongst young people, wow. and so the University of Pondicherry has a social services department. And so they want to outreach in the villages near Pondicherry. And we're designing a center for them where kids can, you know, be encouraged and supported and, you know, ther for, with therapy and, uh, you know, uh, socialization. And so uh, that's another project where I think, you know, um, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, Indian youth that aren't really paid attention to because they don't go to school, right. you know, and so they don't get any of the sort of, uh, you know, um, support that they need. And so, and they're not old enough to work in the farms. So, um, you know, some of them do work at a very young age, but still, uh, so that's a very exciting project. You know, um, the client has never done this. We've never done this. So it's kind of interesting what what kind of programs could go into a building like that. And um, we're doing a school for um, the men uh, mentally disabled children uh, in Washington, which, which is, you know, a... a um, interesting uh, you know uh, client who's got a huge portfolio of schools but you know this includes a, a mentally uh, disabled children of a very young age like six months to I, I don't know how you tell how a kid is mentally uh, disabled that age but you can mm. and so um, you know that's a very important part of what's going to happen in the school and we're about to start that. So those kinds of projects. Are, and we're doing some prefab housing, low-income in, low housing um, for a, a client in Florida. When, when you call the business a non-profit, what does that title mean for you? I mean, from a financial standpoint, you know, it's a 501c3 and we can, uh, we, uh, uh, um, you know, don't make any profit. Uh, we, um, you know, so what that does, it helps the client, you know, who had a budget to use that budget for something else, like say in a school for computers, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, um, in a sort of, uh, say incubate incubator type of building for bakery bakery equipment or you know or art or landscaping or things that you know they they wouldn't normally be able to include in the budget so it is a we don't have a, a profit uh, motive on the so on the, the social aspects of of that is that you know um we aren't driven to uh, make decisions that cut corners and you know don't provide or watching the clock as to which you know pride you're just spending the time it takes to do a project without worrying about you know um 
whether we are losing our shirts or not. So mm -hmm. in that sense, it's very liberating. I'm really happy about that. And on and the, finally, you know, we can actually receive donations, you know, to what we're doing. And so right. we are actively, you know, uh, uh, trying to, and we have found partners that are interested in what we are trying to do, not just uh, clients, but engineering firms and other people, large architecture firms who reached out to us to because their staff, they don't have a nonprofit model, so they can't really get their staff engaged in, in these kinds of socially oriented projects. So they're calling us and we are teaming up with them, with their young people, like you say, who are very interested in social aspects and giving back. What, what sorts of business disciplines have to change and or, or very different from um from sorg for example like you like you were saying you know you don't have to you don't have to keep such a, a tight eye on all the hours that are being billed um how how do you what sorts of things need to be put in place that allow you to have that, a bit more freedom like that or well, what are the kind of other um let's see we have I'll tell you in five years. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's, you know, because, I mean, because I ran a successful practice and built in, built it from nothing. Um, I still rely on a lot of, you know, like say shopping around for computers or, you know, um, uh, we got a grant from Autodesk, you know, or because we are a non -profit. So there's, Ways we are, of course, looking at how to do things economically and, you know, not be frivolous about it. Um, so, I mean, the, 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 the you know, the, the many lessons and years of experience in that are helping out. Um, but, and, and we still have to carry, you know, errors and emissions insurance. We have to carry all the insurances that we had to carry before because we are providing professional services and yeah. all the registrations and you know all the licenses so we, we still have to do that uh, I think it's more about um, you know um, partnering with people that are interested in this area of, of our world our existence and um, making sure we're not you know we're not taking our eyes off of that, you know, because it's very attractive to somebody to call us and say, hey, you know, I love the school you did here or this aquatic center or that, you know, and your, your, your immediate reaction, oh, yeah, that would be fun. That would be great. But, you know, it has nothing to do with what we're trying to do now. So, you know, um, um, I think the discipline is self-control. <laughs> and... And in terms of the leadership team there, obviously you're, you're working very closely with, with Brandon. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, does the, how does the office structure and hierarchy work in a complete unknown and how does it differ from how you were practicing at SORG? Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, you know, the, the qualifications, the people, people, everybody's remote and I've never met them mm. <laughs> since we started hiring. Wow, and, of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, wait, wait, I did meet two of the people and I, I said, I didn't realize how tall they were. <laughs> <laughs> You're six feet, what? And so anyway, um, uh, uh, I mean, the people, the, you know, it's, it's very important that the people that are working in this new endeavor in the, a complete unknown are committed to the mission. Yeah. You know, a lot of architects, are committed to their jobs but not their careers and are committed to um you know um uh, you know need to understand that we are a startup and it's based on this very uh unique but somewhat nebulous idea you know mm -hmm. like, like and so you know uh, they're not going to come out of the other end of this this and have like a huge specialty in something, you know, it's going to be the specialty is going to be in empathy or it's going to be in trust or it's going to be in something that you can't put on your resume with shiny pictures and, you know, 
and so like we just did a competition for habitat for in uh, habitat international for you know how to keep mosquitoes out of buildings that aren't completely plumb you know and so that's very exciting and so the people that are excited about that you know are the kinds of people we are uh, you know trying to get involved in and then they have to get along with each other and with you know with me and everybody amazing brilliant i think that's the, the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation this afternoon or this morning um and just want to say a massive massive thank you and thank you so much for sharing sharing your experience and, and your your insights into running a, a successful practice thank you for having me and that's a wrap and don't forget if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom fulfillment and profit please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly follow the link in the information if you enjoyed today's show please head on over to itunes and leave us a review i read every single one also I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.